Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, Zach here from Fresh Fresh Studios. So we're back again with another episode of Different Strokes. We are working again on Gabriel Angelos. Um, he is a Forge World Chapter Master. We're in the home stretch here. Uh, today, just going to be working on cleaning up some facial details. I'm going to do some hair. I'm going to do this um, uh, loincloth here on the front. And then some more details on the uh, the weapon, just a couple left to do. And then we're going to uh, plow through that base and see where we are from there. That very well might be it. So let's uh, let's get into this and see how we do. It's day 35 Eastern time. So let's see if we can make a good uh, hour and a half out of this at least. All right, so again, like last week, I did not pre-shake my paints. <laughs> so I'm gonna start with uh, the Vallejo game color black. It does dry a little glossy if you don't shake it really well. So I'm gonna make sure that uh, that I get into that. And if anybody's watching, feel free to jump in the chat. At, keep an eye on it. So here we go. I got my wet palette off to the side here as always. This is it here. I was using it a little bit earlier today. Be some true metallic silver and then some yellows and whites there. I was doing some non-metallic metals and then just a hell of a lot of dry brushing. Got a full Grey Knights army that we're working on. All right, so uh, what I'm gonna be doing here to start is the hair up on top. I had already gone ahead and done a lot of the flesh tones before we even started working through the stream on this, um, but I did not do the hair. So first thing I'm going to do is I want him to have black hair. So I'm just going to get in there, hit the ground running, start base coating er anything that I need done in black. Okay. Now I do want to make sure that I'm getting this uh, this hairline right down to his actual skin without messing with any of the uh, the shading that I had already done in there. Yeah, okay, that's done. <laughs> that was quick. I'm gonna do the uh, the handle on the weapon here. Keep wetting my brush. Don't want to let that paint dry up in the actual bristles or travel up into the ferrule. So definitely always keep uh, keep cleaning it. Once these final details are all done, this model is going to look much, much cleaner. Looking forward to getting some uh, final photos of this guy. I put a lot of time into painting today. Like I was honestly, I was painting right up till maybe 20 minutes before we started this stream. There's just stuff that I wanted to get done today and I found that I had some time to do it. So you gotta get it done when you can get it done. But as a result, my brain is definitely mush today. Okay. So what I'm basing, base coating here, it's just a, um, it's like a power cable that's going from the axe head or from the, uh, the shaft to the axe head. So base coating in black, uh, because I'm going to be doing it in silver for silvers. I find that black is the best base coat, particularly because a lot of the time, when I do silvers, I do a black base coat with a very matte black, so it has a, a textured finish to it. But then I dry brush over top of it and do some spot highlights. Honestly, that gives a phenomenal finish. Really a big fan. I don't think I'm going to be doing that today, though. No, I'm going to be getting into the um, Scale 75 Metal and Alchemy 
silver metallics. I don't really use them a whole heck of a lot. Like I said, I do the um, I do do the dry brush method quite a bit for silvers. But the one silver that I've been very attached to, I don't think I have it down here with me. And that was a lie, yes I do. So I've, I've been using this for the last several years. Just machine gun metal from Army Painter. It was a special line that they put out specifically for Zombie Side when that uh, game was uh, all the rage. I had uh, every intention of picking the game up, but I just never got around to it. <laughs> Best of intentions. But uh, anyway, so I've been using that for a few years and now it is almost run its course. I think this uh, Grey Knights project that I'm working on right now, when that's done, that'll be it. That'll be it. And I will have to retire that paint. Okay, give me a sec. I'm just going to see. There we go. Just turning up my mic a little bit here. Okay. Well, if, uh, if anybody's watching right now and you're having issues hearing me, let me know and I'll do my best to, uh, to correct that. Okay, actually, you know what? Several times I've spoken about the, piece, the metallic pieces on this base here and how I just went ahead and base coated them and never actually did anything with them after. Uh, I'm going to commit right now to getting that done. So I'm just going to use the uh, Citadel Null Oil Shade, not the gloss. Nobody wants the gloss. Okay, I'm just going to use a cheap synthetic brush because it's. this is pretty hard on, uh, on brushes. And because it is so thin, it'll freely travel right up the bristles into the ferrule of the brush. So I don't like using good brushes for washes. And I also don't like using them for uh, for dry brushing. You know, for washing and dry brushing, those are not at all um, I don't even know what I'm trying to say there. It's not detail work, I guess I could say. So, you can go cheap. Alright, so that was quick. All I was doing was just shading this, right? So that's going to give us some dry t dry time. Now I was thinking about it and the base, and it is it is green, but I want to give it a little bit of a a brown tint in the shadows. So again, I'm going to grab a cheap brush here. I'm just going to grab the uh, Agrax Earthshade. go around here just to give it a little bit and so I'm not reaching across just to give it a bit of a different hue in the uh, or not hue but a different color in the shadows it's not going to change it drastically because that is not what I want but we'll change it up a little bit. It's going to make the green a little less uh, Christmassy and a little more dirty. I mean, I have no problem treating this guy like Santa Claus, but instead of presents, he's going to bring the pain with this huge Warhammer. Good enough. Let that dry. Well, it'll dry while I'm while I'm working on uh, the detail pieces on it. Just give this a real heavy wash. Looking forward to actually getting into the base work on this thing. And because I only use select washes, um, I can generally get the 
finish that I want out of it. And I don't use washes that have a glossy finish. The matter, the better, and that's just my painting style. All right, last piece for washes. And when I'm doing the hair and the, uh, this, that almost ended badly. Getting ahead of myself. Yeah, once once I get into the handle of his weapon and the hair, it's going to be mainly grays, uh, along with that uh, that loincloth. There we go. All right. Still, even though it's cheap, still clean it off. Look at that. I've been using this forever. See up here, this is what happens when you use washes a lot. It travels right up the bristle, and it just dries in there. It's rock hard up here. I'm going to stick it back in my pot of a million brushes. Let's see. I haven't even quite decided what, uh, what grays I'm going to start with. I know what I want to finish with. Here we go. I haven't used this in a while. So don't mind me if you can hear me shaking it. Going to be using Storm Vermin Fur. Oh, it's a later gray. Um, I would compare it to using Mechanicus, uh, Mechanicus Gray and uh, almost even Dawnstone, but it's it's got a dirtier look to it. It's got more browns and yellows in the gray than blues. So especially for his uh, for his hair. I want that to be a, a dirtier gray. So I had to put a few drops on the palette here. I'll show you here. See what I did. So I got my black down here, but my first, second, and third drops had um, some of that binding agent in it. So if I didn't shake up the paint very well, uh, you would get huge globs of that where the paint separated. But even if you shake it still up in the, uh, up in the actual nozzle, that stuff, the separated paint is still just going to stay up there. You can't really shake that out. So you kind of got to squeeze a few drops out of it. All right. So I did. Uh, I had thinned that very well when I uh, when I initially decanted it. So it's already pre-thin, which is good. All I'm going to do here is right towards the front of his hair. I'm going to drop some gray in there. Put my brush a bit so I can sort of blend it at the back. So basically what's happened is because the paint is thin and it has a fluid in it and a little bit of drying retarder, it's not going to dry right away. So that affords me the time to be able to paint a heavy line where I want the most pigment to stay and then wet my brush a little bit. So clean it and wet it. And then go to the back of that line that I want to blend and feather it in. So, I, yeah, the hair is too small and it's too hidden back in the helmet here to be able to see it properly on the camera. I'll see if I can get some of that after when I'm messing around with the uh, the focus. But definitely on the uh, the finished flows, you'll be able to see it. So. Here, because I did his hair in one color, I don't 
I've got an issue with duplicating colors for uh, for different effects. So if his hair is done in Stormbrim and Fur, I am not going to be doing the um, the handle of his axe in Stormbrim and Fur, even though I want it to uh, to be gray. Well, I want it to be black, but with black, you kind of have to highlight out into a gray. So I've got two that I'm going to be working on. I'm going to be doing Ash and Gray and Mechanicus Standard, GW Paints. I like GW Paints. I like Vallejo and Scale 75 more. But that's just my personal preference. And I am just sort of going through what I have left in GW Paints. Using them as I can. All right. Uh oh. Clog nozzle. Don't mess around with that. Clean. Take care of that. There we go. So what I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to take that Eschen Gray. I've uh, I've wet my the bristles on my paintbrush quite a bit, and I'm just going to be going over the top of this handle here, avoiding all the recessed areas. And the same thing that I did with the hair, I'm going to feather out the hard line of, uh, of pigment. Let's see. And because the, uh, the paint doesn't dry very quickly, because of how I decanted it, I have a little more working time with it, so I can afford to do, you know, four or five of these uh, these ridges all at once. So I am not even going to touch the underside of this uh, of the grip on the handle. Because I want that to be in the uh, in the most shadow and you know what if something's black and it's in shadow it's going to be pretty dark so i'm happy with how that is so i'm going to move on to that mechanicus standard now one thing also about using a wet palette is the more the longer you leave something on the palette the um it will start to uh to absorb more moisture and become more dilute. So you got to keep that in mind when you're actually using this, the uh, the palette, and you're going back to these paints that you've put on there. Uh, you know, five, ten, fifteen minutes, an hour ago. You know, the um, paint is almost always workable to some extent, regardless of how dilute it is. Um, but you do have to uh, apply it di much differently. So. It definitely pays to, uh, hey, Owen, what's going on, man? <laughs> Sorry, distracted me, man. So what I was saying was that um, it definitely pays to be aware of, uh, of how long you put your paint or how long ago you put paint on, uh, on your wet palette. And then, you know what, it might end up being a glaze like consi consistency. And right here, I'm just doing a couple extreme highlights right on the top ridges of those uh, of the grip. 
nothing wild. And what I did use for that, sorry, was uh, Wolf Gray, Vallejo Game Color. Do the same thing for his hair. Just on the very edge. And then go back, I'm gonna texture that hair a little bit in a, in a sec. And you got that uh, black gray hair. So all I'm gonna do here is I'm just stippling it just a tiny bit. Not far enough into the black that would show the um, the very light gray that would actually stand out too much if you use a really light gray on a black for stippling. The idea with stippling textures is that um, you don't want it to stand out. You don't even really want to be able to notice it un until you get really close in there and you're holding something right up to your face almost. All right, um, so from here, so I'm gonna leave that uh, just that handle alone. I'm gonna think on what I wanna do with it in a second, but what I am gonna do is I'm gonna start the metallics. And what I am gonna start with is black metal. Very cool, it's like a um, lead belcher, but even darker. does have a, uh, a blue black tint to it so the uh, the blue tint and the silver is what I'm looking for it's a very cold cold metallic color so you're looking for blues gold is a very warm metallic color Reds, yellows, oranges, stuff like that, warm colors. So just flipping her up. Get underneath, do that your black metal. This also gives me a chance to touch up some of that uh, that golden bronze color that splashed over underneath here. Let's see. There we go. Now I'm just going to check and see if I have any other metallic pieces that I'm missing that I want to touch up. It doesn't look like it. Well, you know what? We'll do these exhaust ports just for posterity. We have the paint out. Might as well use it. All I'm going to do for these is just get the parts that are going to be visible because even looking at it how I am and really angling it so that I can get it well inspected cannot see underneath those ridges. So I'd be wasting my time to try to paint and shade in there and stuff like that. But the uh, it has a natural shade in there just because it underneath those ports is always in shadow. All right. Excuse me for a sec. <clears throat> wow, thanks. All right, we're gonna go up in uh, metallic here. Thrash metal from scale 75, metal and alchemy. Just a couple steps up from that black metal. And I can't stress enough how much I love this line of paints. The metal and alchemy stuff is fantastic. Best metallics I've ever used. Not only is it metallic finish, but also has a uh, but it's got a satin texture to it. It's just, it's perfect. Okay, go. Then 
one more. Dude, where are ya? So skill 75, heavy metal. It's a step up again. This will be our extreme highlight. You know, three layers of silver on a power cable. I must want this thing to look decent. So all I'm doing for this is I'm not uh, going over the full ridge on the uh, on the cable. All I'm doing is catching one line on each ridge, so one edge, just giving a little bit of extra highlight making it look somewhat directional. There we go. Okay, so I'm gonna do my best to keep this into, into frame. But, uh, so here, let's pull up our focus. Let's see that, see if we can catch the focus here. Oh, well, you know what, the metallic is too good, too shiny. See how shiny that is? That is actually mostly the natural color. It's catching a bit of the backlight here. There. Yeah. We'll crank that back up to save my eyes. Okay. Let's get out of this a bit. There. That's better. Okay. And we are going to do just a bit of stippling on the uh, on the handle nothing crazy just to give it a little bit a little bit of texture and with this I'm gonna start with just like I was doing my highlights I'm gonna start with a darker gray in towards the bottom and then move up slightly slightly higher tones or shades what I can do is darker gray all the way through and then just stagger where I start the lighter ones. Okay. So. Anything that's, um, you know, that's being worn or worn out, I should say, you know, like any metallics, metallics especially, um, you know, it's very rare that you're getting a, a super smooth, clean metallic surface. So giving it some texture is a good idea. 
same thing with, you know, like on uh, an axe handle. You know, if, it, if it's wrapped like this one, texture it a bit. You know, Buddy's been holding it for a while. He's been swinging it like crazy. It's going to be worn out. Okay. I think we're good there. What I want to do, because the, uh, the wash is still drying on this base, is now that I am done the handle and the, uh, the power cable, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to use some of these grays. I'm going to get into this loin cloth. Because it's going to be pretty shaded in there, I'm not too worried about getting into the deep recesses. Those are going to be fine staying black. Totally fine. What I am going to be focused on is the top ridges The extreme edges. I want to get into this side of the cloak here. I'm almost doing like a glaze in there. Super thin. It's giving it a bit of extra color. Still keeping it very dark. But I just want to differentiate it. front. Now I can move up just a bit in color. Get some of those edges. Get that bottom edge real quick. Okay. And just this. It's the lightest, thinnest little highlight in that wolf gray. And just give the sun something to catch off anyway. There we go. That was pretty good. There. Love it. Yeah, I put that paint where I didn't want it. There you go. But if you can catch it early enough, and you wet a brush, you just scrub it off if you put a streak of paint where you don't want it. Okay, there we go. Looking pretty tight. Okay, and now I reach over. So I've done some work, like I said, on his skin tones, but I am going to go ahead, I'm just gonna touch them up a little bit use a couple of the uh, scale 75 flesh paints they got these are from the fantasy and games range got harvester flesh and moonray flesh just put a tiny little drop of each on there Go. Right. So I'm going to start with that uh, Harvester Fresh Flesh, which is just slightly, well, I guess not slightly darker. It's actually substantially darker than the, uh, than the moon's, Moon Ray? Moon Ray. Moon Ray Flesh. 
very creative names. I like these uh, Steel 75 paints. They're very easily blendable right out of the bottle. So what I'm doing here is I'm just building off what I had already done. And just uh, brightening up the um, the raised edges of his uh, of his skin. Just increasing the uh, the shading and contrast. Okay, move on to that uh, moon ray. Just some very selective highlights here. Got a couple, couple scars on his face that I'm going to hit with this. The scars have dried white. There we go. Okay, you know, just like the very bridge in the nose. A couple spots up on the forehead, leading maybe leading up the eyebrow. A little bit on the cheekbone, around the orbit of the eye, but that's it. Okay, too much. There we go. Wet my brush and blend that sucker out. Perfect. Oh yeah. That's what I mean. It's really workable, this uh, this paint. Okay, here we go. Keep it back in here. Got to try to be diligent about that, man. She ain't easy. Okay, I'm gonna start getting into the base here. I'm just gonna work around the uh, the stuff that is uh, wet. It should be doable. I'm going to start with the ratty green, very bright emerald green, scale 75. There we go. All right. Here. Be going in diluted. Now, because there's so much texture on this base, and we've done a couple layers of green, plus I had the zenithal shading prior to this, and we've done a wash in there that's drying matte, so it does look like uh, like more of a paint than a wash. Um, and I'm also relying on that for some texture in here as I can be more selective with where I'm putting this uh, this Arati green. This is basically you know the detail work on the base here. And I want it to be textured. I want it to be random and sporadic. Really as I'm going around the base, I'm following what I like to call the rule of cool. Thinking like, you know what? That would look really cool if that was bright green as I'm going around. It's not taking away from any of the effects that I wanted to have on the model. So, yep, I can go for it guilt free. So, I want the, uh, the highlights on this base to be very vibrant. That'll contrast very well with the uh, the muted dark model and with the uh, the muted colors in the shading of the base. It's going to take a few passes, obviously, because I am constantly wetting my brush. I am 
using thin paint also. And if I can get the, uh, the base done on this tonight, I think we can call it finished. And once this is finished, we'll have some other stuff that we can work on. We've got um, streams set up for the next several weeks, which is good. Actually, so I got a stream next week. The week after that is uh, there won't be a stream. Reason being is I have other commitments but then good to go for three weeks following. So here, there's just a piece of stone here. I just put a bunch of heavy strokes of green on there. And because it's wet, I'm just wetting my brush and blending it out in whatever direction I feel looks the best at that particular moment. You know, it's a good way to practice wet blending too because um, half the battle in wet blending, once you know the technique, is learning how to manipulate the paint. A lot of people use two brushes for wet blending, if you know what that is. We can get into that at some point. Um, but uh, a lot of people use two brushes for wet blending, call it two brush blending. I prefer to use one brush. What I do is I put a thick line of paint on there, and then with the paint still on my brush, I go ahead and I wet the brush which basically turns the paint that's on there into a glaze. And then I can use that glaze to feather out that line of paint. It gives a very nice blended finish. Okay, working our way around. When you're trying to blend stuff, it is, it's important to try to work in small sections too. Okay. It's getting there. Just focusing right now on the uh, the larger pieces of stone. I've got another highlight color coming in after this, which will be good. Should tie everything together. Like I said, I want it to be vibrant, but to be vibrant, I don't have to hit literally every single piece on here. It's actually the um, the small amounts of really bright green that are contrasting off the dark base, they're gonna give the, uh, the best, uh, best effect. There we go. Okay, let's see, what are we gonna do here? There's a couple pieces that I missed on the back. Okay, I am good with that right now. Oops, I'm not ready to work on the, the larger display base yet. It's still very wet. So what I am gonna do, grab one of my junk brushes here. Yeah, this is actually one of the ones that I used for a wash earlier. And grab a piece of paper towel. Here's your dry brushing tip. Paper towel. So what I'm gonna do here, let's see, let's get in. Take a 
see some of that green on my brush. Paper towel back and forth, wipe all the excess off. From here, when you where you want a dry brush, you're just flicking it back and forth. Okay. All you're doing is picking up those raised edges. That's all I'm doing on this really textured part here. Any what's going to be like, you know, loose earth and stone is just going to get a little bit of a dry brush. That's all. Don't use it too too much, but uh, it has definitely has its uh, its place in painting. Let's get that in there. All right. See, I think there is a few spots over here that I can uh, that I can knock out with this part anyway. There we go. Okay, I don't need to pick up everything on it too, just to give it a little extra color, so that the uh, the shade on there is not absolute. that sucker up. All right, next up we have Moot Green. Shake that sucker up. Yeah, buddy. Okay. This here, this Moot Green, this is just going to catch some edges. That's it. Just some edges. Give it a little bit of definition in there. Okay. It's really gonna make that uh, that emerald green pop out. We even got something else after this. A big fan of the home stretch on uh, on painting models when you can really, you know, pick some details to work on that uh, that are going to make the model stand out. In this case, I'm really liking the base. I've been waiting <laughs> to get into this. Okay. But it goes quick you know if you set yourself up for success early then a lot of these uh these finishing details you can knock out pretty quick i mean we haven't even been doing this for an hour yet and i'd say we're i'd say we're right on track where we want to be All right. Just a few more. I think we can call it on the moot green on here. Let's catch a couple pieces on this loose rubble, just a bit. It's very sporadic. We want the sun to be catching off those rocks in different places. It would take away from the effect if I did uh, each and every one of them. Okay. 
Some of them I'm actually going to do a heavier moot green on it just so that there's a varying brightness in the greens on the really small pieces. It's kind of like he's uh, writing a shattered emerald. bit of stippling there in here just a bit stippling is great for texturing <laughs> in case you can't tell I'm a fan you know it takes a bit of a steady hand you know, know your brush, but it's good. Just a couple pieces on the back that I'll do. All right. Okay. Then we're going to throw a little bit of gauze plastic green in there. Just for good measure. very pale green so it gives a what did I pick up on that brush yeah there's very pale green so it gives a very glowy effect to it so this is also going to get some stippling action in on the base Too much. Can't have too much on the on the brush tip. We won't be able to control it. Less is better when you're uh, when you're doing any sort of texturing or detail work. Yeah, this base would be totally fine without the uh, the gauze plaster, but I wanted to uh, to add it just to give it just a touch of something else in there. Not gonna go crazy with it though. But, you know, everything can't be a uniform colors and tones, shades. Especially when you're working with, uh, with stuff that would be like a, a natural uh, material, you know, wood, stone, stuff like that, dirt got to be some randomness to it. You 
you know, just like if you're painting marble and you're doing marble veins. Almost done with that. Just a couple little spots. I'm almost all the way around. So once I'm done around here, I'll get this up for the camera. Maybe do a couple veins in this gauze blaster. You know, it's, it is rock, right? So if you have some veins running through it, it does look way more natural than if it was just a uh, you know, slab of green stone sitting on here. You know, these veins, they don't have to be super heavy lines either. You know, probably the fainter the better. Let you guys be the judge when I post some pictures. You know, it just makes sense though that in the, uh, on the brighter areas, these veins are brighter. So that's what I'm aiming to do. All I'm doing to get that effect is I'm keeping the same amount of uh, paint on the brush for each vein, but I am easing the pressure off the, uh, the bristles when I'm passing through darker spots. Yep, she's looking all right. A couple on the back. Okay, let's hold this up here. Get some focus in on this. Yeah, so that's a pretty accurate representation of the what the base looks like in uh, in real life that I'm looking at. So you can see some of the uh, the veins, especially near the front foot here, right up in here. It's got a nice textured uh, textured base. Got it in greens to uh, to contrast against the armor. Got some veining in there too, which is great. Actually, you know what? Throw an audible here. We got a, I got a bunch of grays lined up. Um, I just need maybe like a little bit of brown, and we're gonna do some. We're gonna do some work on the shoulder pads real quick. These are gonna be the white is not gonna be white anymore. I'm gonna do a marble. Let's do a marble. I'll teach you something quick about that too. All right. So marbling. Gonna start with a dark gray. Okay. The this isn't true for all, all marbles, but the iconic marble that uh, that you see is actually from Italy, and not all marble is like that. The iconic marble that you see is it's black, or sorry, that's white with you know, lots of gray and black veins. Um, that's mined for from one specific quarry. And all of the veins in it are totally directional. So that's what we're gonna be doing here. Lots of directional veins. 
one, sorry, one direction. They're all going from one side to the other. And to make it look cool and dynamic, they're going to be on an angle. I'm not going too heavy with it yet. I'm going to be doing a few different colors of gray. Now, I had actually learned this about marble when I was researching how to do it for a different Primark that I was doing. It was actually Horace. That one turned out well. That was actually one of the first uh, commission projects that I had picked up. And just because I don't want them to clash, realistically, I could get this uh, this other shoulder pad going in a totally different direction, but I'm not going to because I don't want them to clash. Now they don't all have to be going; all the veins don't have to be going at the same angle. Um, but they do have to sort of be going in the same direction. And that's not to say you'd be doing it wrong if you're crisscrossing veins everywhere. Um, but the look that you're going for, if you want it to be recognizable, is, uh, you know, go with that iconic marble look. So I've done one tone of gray. I'm gonna jump up. I'm gonna do some of that storm vermin fur. I'm going to throw it directly into some of these veins. I'm gonna do a couple of my own, a couple of new ones. Yeah, buddy, it's going swimmingly. I'm very glad that I had started doing some of that vein in the uh, in the green. And you know what? That also gives me more time for that uh, that display base to dry, and we can plow through that real quick. You know, now that we know specifically what we're doing for the um, sorry for the uh, for the green, got our colors. I'm, I've already got an idea of how to lay it out because I just did it on the character base. I'm doing quite a bit of, uh, of veining on the shoulders here. You can realistically do as, as much or as little as you want. You can have just a few heavy veins going through, or you can have lots of small little cracks like I'm doing. But sporadic, you know, that's key. I'm gonna throw a little bit of black in there. Just into some of the veins. Takes a bit of a steady hand, but very achievable, very doable. The only way to get more brush control is to, by using your brush more. So don't let anything 
stop you from trying new effects. Can't emphasize more that uh, you know the only way to get better at painting is by painting. You know you can watch all the videos you want. Um, like to be honest with you, it's very very rare that I watch painting videos at all. You know I'm the kind of person I like figuring stuff out for myself, and it's worked out so far. Um, you know every once in a while I'll watch videos like uh, the first time I was getting into non-metallic metals you know I watched a couple videos on that but again you know I learned by doing you know the majority of stuff that I do watch is to uh, you know, support friends in the uh, in this hobby. Okay, almost done with those veins. That's pretty good. Okay. All right. Let's see that. Play with the lighting and everything later. Uh, let's see. You know what? Give me a sec. Oh, yeah, I guess you can see that. All right. So you have that marbling. Those veins, you can see they're all unidirectional from one side to the other, flowing across. I got, uh, got three different colors of gray and one black in there. So just different shades of gray. Um, I went back to that storm vermin fur gray. The reason for that being that there's a, a brown tint to it. So I wanted to break it up. I didn't want to just have a uh, very monotonous gray in there. So I think this thing is looking pretty good on uh, on camera. Those finished photos are, are going to look pretty sharp. But for him, I am ready to call him a wrap. What I'm going to do quickly now that I do with all of my models is I'm going to rim the base. I'm going to use a junk brush to do that because I'm going to be using a heavy coat on here. Usually takes a couple goes around. Just gives it a finished clean look. I find, you know, some people if they have, uh, you know, if they're doing dirt and stuff like that on the base, if it's a brown base, you know, they go ahead and they do the rim in brown. You know, whatever floats your boat, but my personal preference is with the uh, a black rim. Like I said, it's it's very sharp. You know, it gives it a very clean, defined finish line. Well, that turned out pretty good. Okay, here we go. Gabriel Angelos. Okay, but from here. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start working to finish up this bad boy. All right, so I'm going to go back to my ready green. Turn my light back up. Save my eyes. There we go. Look at that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no. You know what I did? I got carried away. It wasn't quite dry yet, so I'll just go touch up my fingerprint. Stupid. There we go. Okay. All right, back at her. The ratty green. 
Go back to this display base here. Be very sporadic. We're just looking to make parts of this really pop and stand out against the darker shades. That's all this is. Even though the majority of this base is darker, uh, far darker than the ratty green that I'm using, um, when you're looking at it, your eyes and your brain are actually going to register the erratic green as the primary color on this. And that is why it's going to look like emerald <laughs> as opposed to like a, a forest green. Especially because it's so bright and the way that uh, and with the techniques that we're using um, it's gonna look like the Sun is catching and glinting off the uh, the rock go Bring this bad boy up. Like I said, we're in the home stretch here. You know, I'm kind of in the home stretch of the stream too, uh, but we'll keep going until this is uh, this is finished. And then this will be the final one. So moving forward, you know, we're looking at getting uh, uh, an RMN model in to do this. Um, we'll be doing that up for uh, TJ Lanigan. He's a uh, competitive gamer. He does the circuit. Ran into him at an event. And, uh, you know, uh, offered him up a uh, free model of his choice, and that's what he came up with. So I'm going to do something real nice for him, something that he can be proud to have on the table. He has a fantastically painted army already. So i got to make sure I sort of one-up that. Let's see. Gonna do this lens here. Lensing is also a tutorial that I will get into at some point. Got big plans. First step was to get a few streams in, get all the technical bugs out of the way, figure this whole process out, and then move into more stuff, you know, we, if we have, uh, you know, time, we can do non-metallic metal tutorial videos, we can do lenses and effects, power weapons, true metallics, weathering, you know, there's lots of stuff that we could do. Wet blending, that's a big one. But the idea is to do them all on cool models so that we have a nice finished product at the end of, you know, a half dozen videos. Right, just making our way through this. Get in there. Like I said, this part goes pretty quick because I already have a uh, a rough idea of how it's going to be laid out. Just throw a couple spots of a ratty green into that loose rubble there, 
Sun is catching. Right. Almost. Is this it for a ready green? Will we see it again? Yep. Still got this piece. But going through quick. Quick, quick, quick. Not rushed quick but everything is deliberate you're not really guessing right now at what i'm doing which is also a key to uh to fast and efficient painting is plan out what you're going to do ahead of time you know If I knew what colors I was going to be doing for the green and then um, the uh, funny enough these display bases should have actually been my uh, my trial for how I want to do the green but Gabriel was my uh, was the sort of dry run for it uh, because these bases the display ones because the amount of crevices and stuff like that were taking quite a while for some of that wash texture to dry but we're good now we're moving and I already have my paints set up on the palette we're in good shape some streaking on the front surface there you all can't be in shade I'm gonna blend some of that out nice and wet All right. Okay, now I'm just gonna quickly finish this up in the back edges. Just a little bit of green, a ruddy green on the topmost edges. And then we'll jump back into that, uh, that initial portion of the base. Get our moot green going on that one. All right. Okay. Go back here. Get that moot green on the edges. All right. Once we get some highlighted edges in this, again, not every edge, but selective, because this is a, uh, it's all natural texture, so there has to be randomness to it. And you can't have a perfectly uniform, natural, natural detextured surface. You know, like I said, stonework, <laughs> um, wood, so any axe handles, rubble, uh, can't be uniform. It's all uniform, 
then you're losing any effect that you want, the effect that you want. As soon as that's done, we can jump into uh, some quick stippling with uh, the moot green, just in a few select spots. And then we can do the um, stippling with our, what's it called again, Gauss Blaster. Gauss Blaster, and then do some of those sweet emerald veins. Whether emeralds have veins or not, I have no idea. I'm going to assume that they might. Well, they probably do. But regardless, it looks really cool. So that's what we're going to do. Rule of cool, like I said. Get a little bit of moot green stippling in here. Not going to go into those uh, heavily shaded areas. God, I keep pulling this off camera. So I'm going to avoid the really heavily shaded areas in here, but I am going to stay closer to the brighter edges. Okay. All right. Just looking to finish that up. I'm really looking to get into those, uh, into that uh, vein. Okay. Just a couple more pieces. Just get catch one at the back here. See, I didn't get any of that moot green. Just a bit. Stipple just a bit. Just to break it up, make it look like little. The idea with the stippling is when you're texturing it, you're making it look like the rock has tiny little chips and imperfections in it that the uh, the light is catching on. Oh, I guess I can touch up that lens here too. Just grab some more moot green, a little bit of erratic green together. So just quickly about lenses, without doing a full-on tutorial. If it's a glass lens, what's happening is the light, you have a, sorry, you have a color to the lens. In this case, I just want it to be green because it's what I'm working with and it matches the base. But the light is going to be coming in from one direction and coming out the other. So if there was no light, that glass, even though it's green glass, would be black. But because there's light that's going to be passing through it, and the way that I have set up Gabriel if the light is coming down this way, right, is that uh, it's coming through the top and coming out the bottom. So it's going to be illuminating this bottom piece. That's going to be the brightest green. And when you see things like lots of gems on Eldar, uh, let's see, what do I have here to finish what I'm speaking about? We're going to do a very brilliant white. So to represent the, where the light is coming in, we are just going to do a couple white dots up there, right in the top. So you got a dark green to a light green, so a very dark green, almost like a black at the, up at the top, going down into a bright green. See, I could even stand to brighten that up just a little bit more at the very bottom. So, and that'll have to be blended out, that hard line. So 
but that is how you do gem effects. Okay, quick, simple. Just gotta remember, I've got a dark color to a light color, and all it is is the direction of the light passing through the gem or the lens. You can do that with literally any sort of glass surface that you're painting for miniatures. So just remember those little sunspots at the, at the very top where the light's coming directly through. Okay. So now we gotta do that moot green quickly over here on this section of the base. I'm still not 100% sure how this base goes together. I've been playing around with it here and there and you can get it to work but you know it's kind of almost like if you want it to stay you either have to have it as the model only as a display model or only as a playable model you know I'm, I'd like uh, him to be able to use it for both so I'm just going to leave this display base finished but disassembled so that uh, if he wants to display it, he can just pop Gabriel in there and sort of close this around it, right? It's gonna close around like that. Gabriel's gonna be sit in, sitting in the, in the middle, but then when he wants to use it, he's just gonna have to take it apart, you know? So that'll stay if you're just having it sitting up on a shelf. I'm just going to catch some some edges on this thing. Okay, not going to go hog wild. If I get through this, then we'll do the veins. And then we're done. Yeah. I've had this model way too long because I wanted to do it on camera. I do use my fingers a lot if you didn't notice that um, when I'm painting if I find that I put just a, a bit too much paint on something I'll buff it out with my finger no big deal So when I am doing the edges and stuff like that uh, on here, it's to my advantage and it's m way more efficient to when I come at an edge, come at it at an angle. So a 45 degree angle is best, it's not always achievable. So if I'm keeping the, um, the edge of the surface perpendicular to my bristle, or to the bristles, then it, it works the best. Same thing if you're doing just straight edge highlighting, you know, like if you're doing a Space Marine, for example, lots of edge highlights available on those things. So just remember 45 degree angle, you'd be good as gold. Okay, bit of stippling on here. After I uh, wet my brush, I am a big fan of licking my brush. I do get paint on my lips all the time, but it uh, just helps me shape the tip real quick. Just give me a little stipple. Make my way around it and then you do some veins. Okay, 
again, avoiding all those uh, heavily shaded areas and just focusing on areas that have a majority of erratic green on it. Alright, it's good for that. Do some veins. Actually, sorry, before that, even just a few quick pokes with the uh, uh, whatever the paint is, Gauss Blaster. A couple quick ones. Again, just some additional texture. pretty big trend in painting lately that I've noticed the past couple of years is people texturing more and more and more. I really like how this um, hobby is constantly evolving with new products, new techniques, you know, especially with, you know, uh, social media and, you know, YouTube videos and painting competitions and all the, this information is just so out there now. And People like putting it out there. People like showing off what they can do and we all benefit from it. You know, when somebody posts a close up picture of, uh, you know, a face of a model that they've done and maybe, yeah, you know what? If, if I, uh, you can see one of the big names in painting and, you know, they've posted a picture of a model and, you know, it looks phenomenal and flawless but then they post the uh, the close-up photos of it. And you can see, oh yeah, you know, I can see the brush strokes. I can see where they blended that. I can see this, that, and the other thing. And hang on a sec. Ooh. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right, Logan. Um, so for edge highlighting, it, it does really depend on uh, on the size of model and, and what I'm doing and how much paint I want to have on it. The tip size of the brush, um, it's pretty much the same across the board for all brushes. But um, if I'm doing something small, like if I was doing a Space Marine, then a one or a zero would be good. Um, I was doing a... Um, a night earlier today and you know I had big pieces of plate with lots of trim work on it and because I wanted to quickly edge highlight that trim then what I did was I had actually a number two so I was able to get lots of paint on there uh, I didn't have it in a big drop or anything like that but I wanted the bristles to be able to hold a lot of paint so that I could carry a line all the way down one full stretch of trim without having to stop, go back to the palette, go back, you know, two or three times. Um, so one thing that I've been doing here, Logan, for texturing is uh, stippling. And so stippling is a pretty quick and, uh, and easy technique. Um, like I said, it, it does take a bit of brush control. So be practice a few times first but all it is is just you know get a fresh tip so like I said I lick my brushes get a fresh tip just a little bit of paint on the end of it you can see that there against my thumb barely even you know you can barely see that uh, that amount of paint hold everything steady and just tip down just the tiniest little dots pretending pretend like um, you're doing the eyeballs of a model and you're just doing eyeball pupils over and over and over and over and over, but you're doing it quick and sporadic. Uh -huh. So now, 
gonna go ahead, I'm gonna start picking out some veins that I'm gonna do. Again, no particular rhyme or reason to where I'm placing them, but they are gonna be done in different, uh, sorry, different thicknesses and different um, amounts of visibility. So they are definitely going to stand out more against the uh, the erratic green and less into the uh, the shading. And again, all I'm doing when I'm passing through shaded areas is I'm just taking pressure off of the uh, the bristles. Yeah, and, uh, and Logan, to, to sort of expand on what you were asking me there about, uh, about texturing, um, I'm planning to do a, uh, a little video, a video series on um, some of the Golden uh, Demon entries that I'm going to be doing over the year. And um, one of them, I'm going to be doing True Metallics for it. I'm going to use the Scale 75 paints, but I'm going to be showing some very cool weathering uh, techniques for, uh, for metallics. You know all the uh, oxidized colors and uh, and patina and stuff like that. So lots of blues and greens that are going to be uh, contrasting against a uh, brass armor. Stuff like that is a little bit more complicated, but still very doable if you know what you want to be looking for. Certainly helps to have access to a, uh, a wide array of paints. Um, I'm pretty fortunate. Some people spend their money on models. I spend mine on paints. Now, because I'm using such a, a small amount of paint, on the end of the brush, it does dry fairly quickly. So if I am careless and I forget to uh, to wash the tip or or reshape the bristles, it definitely dries up very quickly. Okay, almost done with this part. Gonna do one more vein. Let's see, red hue is good. Yeah, a couple of them would be fine. Yeah, that's the yeah, that's the plan, Logan. As soon as um, <laughs> as soon as I saw the announcement that Golden Demon was gonna be coming to Adepticon and I don't have to go to Europe, um, I uh, immediately texted. Uh, I texted Adam and I said, hey man, I got an FT50 with six seats and a whole lot of bed space in there. Uh, like let's let's get a bunch of guys together and do a road trip down there. And he's game for that. Cause they, I know uh, they road trip down every year, um, but I figured I'd offer up uh, my vehicle, you know, certainly help to uh, be able to carry everybody's models and armies in the bed of a truck as opposed to, uh, you know, the, sitting on people's laps maybe. I don't know what they drove down in last time, but I'm confident in the size of my vehicle to be a comfortable drive. So over the next year, I'm planning to put as many uh, entries together as possible. I have a, a fair amount of, uh, of cool models sitting around the studio here that I have always had a um, uh, the best of intentions on getting done. Uh, like lots of box sets that I bought, but just never ever actually got around to it. So this will be a great opportunity to sort of force my hand into getting stuff done. You know, and if I win, if I win some stuff, that'd be cool. If I don't, like that's cool too. It'd be a fun trip. 
good learning experience. It's always good to push yourself too. I try to take on at least one personal project every year. Um, this year, uh, at the beginning of the year, it was a, a zombie dragon from Creature Caster. Uh, I did that specifically for their Resin Beast contest at Adepticon. I didn't go, but I sent it down with somebody. I didn't win anything, but it got some good feedback, which is great. But I was very happy with how that model turned out. Learned a lot as well. Like I said, it's good to push yourself once in a while, break up the norm, especially even to get out of just regular games workshop stuff. Yeah, yeah. Best motivator is a deadline, that is for sure. But it will be cool. You know, it'd be uh it would be nice once I get some of these big projects that I have sitting on my lap out of the way. I've actually got um, only one big project that I'm working on right now, but I've got a handful of small ones that are, you know, I've got, you know, a knight, I've got a couple of units of space marines, I've got a handful of characters and some harlequins and stuff like that. And they're all sort of sitting right on the cusp of being finished. And they all sort of need a couple dedicated days just to get it finished. I got Blackstone Fortress that uh, that one's all finished it's been done for a bit but I've just been plugging away at the custom bases for it that came from secret weapon models and those are just about finished but now it's a matter of mounting those all those uh, models onto the the resin bases properly the um... oh yeah look and I will I'm going to be at Adepticon next year. I already uh, told my wife. <laughs> said, so this is what I'm doing next year. All right. Look at that. Okay. You know what I am going to do is I'm going to quickly touch up the metallics on that. Oh yeah, here we go. So these were the bases for the Blackstone Fortress. I just gotta rim them all in black and then they're they're done, but because they're solid resin, um, it has to be either pinned or super glued. And all of the Blackstone Fortress models are on slot bases. So I'm just gonna use Moonstone Alchemy here, or sorry, Amber Alchemy. My bad, not Moonstone. Amber Alchemy is going to go onto these pieces here. I'm just going to do some quick edges. You know what? Just because you're here, Logan, and you were asking, I am going to do some additional textures on these metallics. Because you know what? They've been sitting here in the dirt, on the, on the rocks. They've been exposed to the elements. They're busted up. Let's get that. Let's get some oxidization on those. Show you something cool. Right. Let's just finish up with this gold here. spots on some of those old shell casings and I'll grab this piece over here can't forget it I 
again, like when I'm doing highlights and stuff like that, I definitely don't follow the sort of typical Games Workshop prescribed method of highlighting models, you know, where they do sort of like a rough highlight that's thick and then followed by a very thin edge highlight. No, I, I like to just let the shading of the overall model influence where the highlights are going to be. Okay, so forgive me for one sec. I'm just going to have to root around here for a couple paints that I wasn't uh, anticipating using. Let's see. Uh, don't close that laptop. I'm pretty sure what's going to work. I'm going to use some turquoise. And then we got some Caribbean blue. Good? Good. They haven't been shaken. So forgive me. Totally wholesome off camera. Turquoise out. Some of this Caribbean blue. Oh, don't be fucking clogged. There we go. Okay. So for this, I'm going to take him out, actually. I'm going to really wet my brush. I want it wet. Okay. All I'm doing, like let's say I'm picking the rivets out, and this is really wet, like I said, it's pretty much a glaze. And what I want to do is I want the oxidization to sort of hang out close to where there would be any seams and stuff like that cracks and seams. You can have a little bit here and there, but really where the recesses are going to be. So all you're doing really with this is you're tinting the metallics a certain color. couple other spots but again mainly where there's recessed areas and seams then I'm gonna do the same thing with my Caribbean blue and I'm just going to very lightly stipple some of that blue in here this is literally getting, so that turquoise that I did, with it being super thin, if you've ever seen that, um, whatever it is, oxide paint, that blue oxide paint from Games Workshop in their technical range, it's, it's doing the exact same as this. You know, it's basically just a watered down paint with a matte finish. Um, same thing with their uh, Agrellin Earth. You know, that technical paint, I use it. I'm not going to say I don't use it because it's convenient and quick, but all it is is a crackle medium in some paint. You know, they, they are big fans of rebranding uh, an established technique under their own name. It's kind of like their new, um, uh, what is it even called? You must know what it's called. The um, they just re they just announced it. It's like a new range of layer paints kind of thing. That's it's basically a gloss. 
or a glaze, I should say, basically a glaze. And all it is is, is taking advantage of the pre-shading on the model to put a glaze over top of it to tint it. It's the same thing that people have been doing forever. You know, they're just putting a different name to it because they can brand it now. Yeah, contrast paints, there we go. Yeah, so their contrast paint method is basically the same thing that I've been doing on models forever. Um, all you're doing is you're getting a black base on the model, black base coat. You're doing a white spray over it or whatever color spray they want you want to put on it and leaving the recessed areas darker, whereas the raised areas are white lighter. And then you're just putting a very dilute paint over top of it and you're letting the base color show through that color. That's all it is. It's like I said, it's an established technique. And I mean, it's cool to see, um, you know, them making stuff like that mainstream, but it's also kind of frustrating at the same time to see it, uh, you know, them basically taking credit for something that people have been doing, like I said, forever. But even with their technical range of paints, you know, you're still not going to get the same um, effect that you would by, you know, doing it the traditional method. Especially if you know how to set it up deliberately to get the effect that you want. Okay, so I'm almost done here. I'm gonna go back to this piece. I'm just gonna get a little bit more in some of these recessed areas. There we go, just let it flow right in there. And that's the furnace. This is the cold weather that never ends. Okay. So I'm gonna go back to my Caribbean blue. Just quick, just a little bit in there, just to break, break it up. Again, it's, it's easy just to throw one color of paint on something and say, effect achieved. Well, you have to have some variance in it. You have to have some variance in the color. Otherwise, it, it is just going to look boring. You know, you want to be able to pick up a model, inspect it real close to see all the nuances that, you know, the artist has, uh, has taken the time to actually deliberately set. case a lot of the uh, Caribbean blue is just being stippled into here like I said big fan and we're almost done Do the uh, the rim of this. Just make sure that I'm cleaning it up nice. For Aaron, I want him to have a very cool model. I want it to be well finished. had it so long I figure I owe him a very outstanding piece am I too 
slide Gabriel in there. And there we have it. Gabriel Angelos. Look at that. What do you think? All right. So just to, to recap on this model, um, what I did to set this up was I pre-assembled him because there wasn't a whole lot of stuff that was going to be able to inhibit um, brush strokes, which is good. I primed him in black. Uh, primed him in black everywhere. Thanks, Logan. Uh, I'll get, I'm going to get some pictures up. Um, so Aaron's going to have to wait on, uh, on me handing this over probably until next week. Um, but uh, so I set this up. I pre-assembled it. And then what I did was uh, primed it in black, made sure that I got every single angle just to cut out my workload after the fact in touch-ups. And then um, I took the airbrush, did a zenithal shade in, uh, in white. So that's from the top down in white. Um, but uh, yeah, sorry, you know what? That was a lie. It wasn't a zenithal. It was mm, almost <laughs> came down in, in an angle. So, and then what I went over everything in, uh, in red in the same fashion. But then I did for the, um, so again, sorry, that's like kind of like the, what happened with the contrast paints is the, the white and the black, um, the red picked up the, uh, the whites more and hid in the, the shadows. And then what I did is I did uh, a heavy wash in Drakenhof Nightshade, which is a very matte based, um, uh, or sorry, a matte finish blue shade from, uh, from Citadel, from Games Workshop lines. And then, so that gave all these shadows that blue black texture. And that's where I left the darkest shadows was that very blue black, not full black, but the blue is what's contrasting against the red of the armor. So even though all the shot there's heavy shadows in here, you're seeing almost everything as exclusively red, right? And that too did a lot of the grunt work for the cloak. Um, this cape here, all I was doing for that was I took the uh, the natural, or sorry, the shading that was already in there, and then I just went ahead and all I had to do was work from the inside out with uh, with different shades of red up into highlights, um, lots of wet blending on the cloak here to try to get it to uh, a nice smooth finish so that you don't see the brush strokes either, which I think I, uh, I achieved that. Same thing up here on top. And then, uh, like I said, the green base, I did that deliberately so that it would contrast against the red armor as opposed to uh, the brown base like the cover art. You know, and then we took a few artistic liberties here. Um, you know, I did certain things in metallics that uh, the box art didn't have. Um, you know, the the shoulder pads weren't marbled. Uh, what else? Um, different skulls in different places, stuff like that. But overall, I'm I'm really pleased with how this came out. Um, so I believe I did this start to finish minus the pre-shading and uh, and that heavy blue wash everything beyond that I did over four streams so I think all in all on video we have maybe about eight hours of work into this guy so once you start to figure out what you're doing and uh, you know you you know how to achieve certain effects and techniques then painting can go pretty quick and you can get a great finished result uh, with uh, you know I'm, I'm not going to say minimal effort because it's not minimal effort but a minimal amount of time um, but yeah overall very happy with how this went um, like I said doing this on a stream was a pretty steep learning curve for me uh, but it's going smoother and smoother every week um, especially even framing the models speaking to the camera setting up the stream to making sure that I don't have too many devices running off my router at the same time. 
which was the uh, the problem with the first stream we did. Everything was smooth in the test, but then it came stream time, and there was two Chromecasts, a smart TV, and uh, uh, you know, and the laptop running to do the uh, the stream. So that was kind of a pain. But like I said, lots more models coming down the pipe. Um, got a model for TJ Lanigan that uh, that'll be doing. I also going to have some um, Golden Demon entries that we'll be doing over the course of streams as well. So that's it for tonight. You know, we're, uh, we're a little after 10.30, so it's one of the, the longer streams at the moment. And uh, rock on, guys. Thank you very much, and we'll, uh, we'll see you next week.